Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. We are glad that you're with us today, whether you're at the Klein campus or you're up at the Woodlands campus or if you are with us via online, it's great to have you all worshiping at Faith Bridge today. We are right in the middle of a three-part sermon series that we're calling Jesus the Prequel. Now, a prequel, of course, is the story before the story. And in the case of Jesus, the story before his story is the Old Testament, And as you may know, the Old Testament is uh, approximately the first two-thirds of the Bible, give or take a few chapters. It is primarily concerned with the history of the nation of Israel, how they came to be, and uh, what their years and lives were like in the earliest uh, years of their formation. I've observed over the years as a pastor, though, that for many Christians, The Old Testament could perhaps best be described as optional reading. Uh, It's got some interesting stories in there, some nuggets of wisdom, but by and large, uh, for many people, I'm afraid, it's just sort of an unnecessary prelude to the real action which starts with Jesus in the New Testament. And that's very unfortunate because nothing could be further from the truth. The Old Testament, in fact, is a very necessary introduction to the life of Jesus. Everything about it is pointing toward Jesus. There are themes that run all the way through the Old Testament that point toward His life and the sort of Savior that He would be, thereby impacting the sort of people that you and I are called to be. And so, I'd like to challenge us all in these days to begin to take sort of a different look at the Old Testament, perhaps than we may have before. In this series, we are looking at three of those themes that are to be found in the Old Testament, kingship, the law, and the temple. You'll find all three of those themes predominant in the Old Testament scriptures, and they all, as I said, point toward the life of Jesus and have direct implications for those of us who choose to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. Last week, Adam McIntyre helped us understand the whole idea of kingship and how that is lived out uh, in the person of Jesus and how Jesus desires to be the king of our lives in an everyday sort of way. Next week on Palm Sunday, uh, Pastor Ken is going to be talking about the temple. And that's timely because uh, Palm Sunday, of course, is the beginning of Holy Week. And the temple is a point of action, a a recurring point of action throughout Holy Week. And so Pastor Ken will help us understand what that theme is all about. Today, though, we're going to be talking about the law, the Old Testament law. Law is uh, vital to understanding the Old Testament and to help us gain a proper understanding of what it means for Jesus and what it means for us. We're going to be looking at two different passages of Scripture. The first in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, and then the second in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. If you have need of a Bible, just raise your hand. The ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep if you have that need. First of all, reading from Mark, chapter 3, and we will begin in verse 1. Mark 3, verse 1. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Now, let me stop right there for just a moment and point out that Sabbath was a central part of the law. To obey the Sabbath was a necessary part of the law, so necessary that it made the top ten, as you may recall. And so it's nothing to be trifled with if you want to be a good law-abiding Israelite. Picking up in verse 3, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, 
Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn heart, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And then in the very next book, Luke, we're in chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. 13, 10. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what has bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Let's pray together. Father, we are immensely grateful for the gift of your word, both the living word, Jesus Christ, and the written word, your holy scriptures. We pray now that as we turn our attention to the scriptures, you would fulfill your promise and that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide us into all truth. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus, amen. So I have a confession to make this morning. Uh, It's something that I'm not uh, particularly proud of. I wish I did not have to. But here at Faith Bridge, we believe in transparency. That's a a premium value for us. Uh, Certainly for those of us that are in leadership and who are responsible for shepherding the sheep. Uh, So it's like this. I am a recovering legalist. Now, a legalist, as you probably know, is someone who takes great comfort in knowing and following the rules. And they are superb at recognizing who follows the rules well and who follows them rather poorly. It's a very clean sort of way to live. It's a relaxed sort of way to live in the sense that it's all black and white. It's just right out there, good, bad, right, wrong, in, out, none of that messy, gray, in the middle, mushy kind of stuff. Legalists know the score and have an expectation that other people are going to know the score as well. In fact, one of the nice things, one of the the draws, if you will, to being a legalist is that as a legalist, you generally get to decide which rules really need to be followed. (laughs) And ultimately, you get to be the decider of who's in and who is out. And for about the first, oh, decade or so of my Christian experience, I turned legalism into an art form. I was... uh, an expert at putting people in little boxes, pigeonholing them, discerning quickly whether or not they were living by the rules, the rules as I understood them to be. And then a couple of things happened in my life that shook my legalism right to its core. And the first of those was that I went through a divorce. That was not supposed to happen. I mean, after all, this is me we're talking about here. Pastor Dan. 
Pastors don't go through those kinds of things. Pastors don't have divorces. And yet, there I was, going through one myself. And it wasn't all so clear cut. There was some gray in there. The second thing that I experienced in the midst of my shame and my pain, my humiliation, and the inescapable realization that I was no better at keeping the rules than anyone else, in the midst of all that, I experienced grace. I experienced the mercy and kindness and love, the unconditional love of Jesus. And in the aftermath of that, both the shame and the grace, suddenly legalism lost a great deal of its appeal for me. Just wasn't as much fun anymore. It wasn't as clean and safe as it used to be. The fact is, all of us, to some degree, are legalists. At least in some area of our life. We've got the rules figured out. We know what the score should be. After all, as I said, it is a very convenient way to live. We all like to think that we have a handle on the truth, that we know right from wrong, that we know what is best. And it's good to be able to surround ourselves with people who are like-minded, who also have a handle on the truth, who also know the score and choose to live the way we choose to live. But doggone it, these people with their stinking messed up lives keep coming in to our lives, especially if we're involved in the church. The nerve of those folks to come around with their problems and their issues and their lives that are completely outside of the rules. It just messes everything up. It's so much more nice when we all know the rules and everyone follows the rules. There's just one problem with that. We call ourselves Christ followers and the fact is Jesus did not live that way. In fact, Jesus moved toward messed up people. And I'm not talking just a little messed up. I'm talking prostitutes, women who sold their bodies, people struggling with addictions, the demon-possessed, thieves, all sorts of unsavory characters. Jesus, like a magnet, was drawn to these kinds of people. And so, if we're finding a life of legalism to be an incredibly convenient sort of thing, I think at the least we have to step back and ask Is it biblical? Is it really what Jesus would do? These passages here would indicate not. I mean, the the two that we read are just two of about 30 such encounters that Jesus had with the legalists of his day. And, And these two really are two of the more calm episodes. There are some other encounters where Jesus calls these uh, individuals things like snakes, vipers, sons of hell, whitewashed tombs. He had no patience whatsoever for the rule keepers. On the one hand, that's really sort of puzzling. Because even a cursory reading of the Old Testament demonstrates that the law was important. It wasn't an afterthought. It is a central theme to the Old Testament. And even Jesus himself said once upon a time, Don't think I've come to abolish the law. No, sir. I have come to fulfill it, to make sure it is fulfilled right down to the last stroke of the pen. So on the one hand, we've got this clear understanding that the law is vital and important. Even Jesus is talking about how it must be fulfilled. But then on the other hand, we've got Jesus taking these people to the cleaners who are trying to keep the law. What's that all about? Why why is he so angry? Why is he so upset with these people who are simply doing what they were supposed to do? Well, in order to get an answer for that, we have to go back to when the law first came to be. 
You will recall from your reading of the Old Testament or perhaps from watching the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, whatever your source may be, (laughs) that when God called the Israelites to Himself and chose them to be His special people, He gave to them a set of rules, a code of conduct that came to be known as the law. And he gave that to them for at least two reasons. First of all, he gave them the law in order that they might be a certain kind of people. Namely, a people who lived in an ongoing relationship with the living God, being shaped and formed by that relationship. He wanted them to be a certain kind of people so that secondly, they would then go out into the world and do certain things for God, primary among them, ushering in God's kingdom here on earth. Be and then do. The order is very, very important. The law is designed, was designed to help the Israelites be a certain kind of people that they might do certain kind of things. However, with the passing of time, the Israelites basically turned it completely backward. They found this notion of an ongoing relationship with God to be too difficult. It was much more easy to simply follow the rules. And so they started to do certain things in order to be a certain kind of person. And that, friends, is the very essence of legalism. When you start to define yourself on the basis of what you do, when your identity is wrapped up in what you do rather than who you are, you are headed down the slippery slope of legalism. And here's the thing, friends. Being a legalist isn't just annoying, it's deadly. It is deadly. Why? Well, in essence, God had said to the Israelites, look, I'm going to give you this law, and the context here is we will live out this law together in relationship so that you might do certain things for me. Be and then do. But when the Israelites backed up from that and said, you know what, that, that's way too hard. We'd rather just do good things in order to be a certain kind of people. They essentially made for themselves an idol. They walked away from the living God. God said it's relationship that brings life. It's not rules. The rules flow out of the relationship. But they weren't interested in that. And instead of worshiping and knowing and loving the God of the law, they instead chose to worship and know and love the law of God. They made for themselves an idol. And one of the reasons Jesus came was to turn that situation back around. And to begin to help both the Israelites and all of his subsequent followers, that would be you and me, get hold of the fact that following the rules is not what it means to be a Christ follower. That's not the core. That's not the central part of what it means to be a Christian. In essence, Jesus came to the world and said, look, I know that you're imperfect. I know that you can't keep the rules, but that's okay. Because I've come to show you a better way. I've come to show you the way of grace, of mercy, of kindness, of forgiveness, of unconditional love, of my desire to meet you right where you are and love you just as you are. And in the context of that relationship, you will suddenly find yourself able to live the life that pleases me, that pleases the Father. But it will never come from simply following the rules. In another encounter that Jesus had with these rule followers, we find it in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, he said to them, You people search the scriptures and read it diligently. You study it day and night because you think in them you're going to find eternal life. But what you don't understand is that the scriptures speak of me. I am life and it is in a relationship with me that you will find life, not by becoming a rule 
follower. Needless to say, the rule followers of the day were not that enamored of what Jesus was promoting, even to the point that they decided to do away with him. So, what does all of this have to do with us in 2015? Well, actually quite a lot, because legalism is alive and well in the 21st century. How about you? Are you a person who chooses to live by the rules? Judges other people by the way they live by the rules? Makes everyone around you miserable by your insistence upon the rules? Or are you a person of grace? A person of love? A person of forgiveness? You know, being a legalist, as I said earlier, is a a recovering sort of condition. I call myself recovering because I slip back into it just like that. I think a lot of the time we slip back into it and don't even know that we're doing it. So let me give you a little test that I think is helpful for us to do some self-examination and decide, where, where do I tend to fall? On the legalistic side or more on the grace side? It's a very simple test. How do you treat other people? How do you treat other people? Legalistically or with grace? Because the way you treat other people is a direct reflection of the way you understand your relationship with God. Years ago, I served in another church. And after I had been at this church for about a year or so, one of the Sunday school classes, a 30-something class, which I was a part of at the time, so it was a while back, uh, they invited me to become one of their Sunday school teachers. And I was happy to do it. They were a sharp bunch of folks, uh, college-educated, upwardly mobile, goal-oriented, successful in their chosen fields. I enjoyed being their teacher, but over time, I began to observe a Sunday morning ritual. It involved one particular couple in the class. And this couple, I'll call them the Smiths, were not quite like everyone else. Uh, For starters, they were from a rural background, and everyone else was either from the city or the suburbs. Uh, Neither of them had graduated from college. He was a truck driver. She was a, a teacher's aide. They didn't make a lot of money. They weren't particularly sophisticated people. And I began to notice that on Sunday mornings, there was this ritual of ostracizing and isolating the Smiths by the other class members. And it was, I mean, if it hadn't been so sad, it it would have been an amazing sociological phenomenon to witness how adept these people were at dodging and maneuvering and manipulating so as to move the Smiths over here or over there or anything to avoid sustained contact and conversation with the Smiths. And perhaps the the, the saddest episode that I ever witnessed this phenomenon took place at their annual Christmas party. When we arrived, we noticed that there was assigned seating. Round tables, three couples to a table, except for one table which had room for two. And the two who were assigned to sit there were the Smiths and the Slagles. I never asked, but I assume the reason we were seated there with the Smiths was because the thinking must have been, well, you know, we'll put them with the pastor because the pastor has to be nice (laughs) to people. As I reflected on that whole experience there, it occurred to me that These folks were not just snobs. Really, that was the least of their problems. Something much more serious going on. A heart issue. These people could not extend grace because they had never received grace. They had established the rules for that part of their life. Uh, I looked all over that Sunday school class and closets and 
bookshelves. I never did find a copy of them, but there were rules. And the Smiths, unfortunately, did not live by the rules. And yet, underneath their perfectly manicured lives, there was pain and woundedness and addictions and adultery and all sorts of other things that provided a crumbling foundation for the facade they wanted to present that they were following the rules. These were church-going people. And yet, they had neither grasped nor had they been grasped by grace. God's desire to meet us and love us just as we are. Here at Faith Bridge, we like to talk about real people, real life. That's our slogan. And it's a good one. I like it. I, I think it encapsulates well the essence of the gospel. That we don't have to dress up for Jesus. That we don't have to get ourselves cleaned up for Jesus. That he meets us just as we are, loves us just as we are, loves us too much to let us stay there. But to begin with, it's unconditional love coming our way. Real people, real life. I like it. But I'm not so naive as to think that we are batting a thousand here at Faith Bridge. I would imagine in a church this size, there's all sorts of people here with regard to grace. I wouldn't be surprised at all to learn that today there are probably some people here who are hearing this message of grace for the very first time. You probably thought, Always that, that being a, a Christian, being a Christ follower was, well, you know, knowing the rules, living by the rules, going to church, don't drink, dance, chew, run with girls who do, all those kinds of rules. <laughs> all of a sudden, here's this guy up there talking about grace, uh, unconditional love. You know, I, I, I don't have to get myself all straightened out for Jesus. No, you really don't. You really don't. Maybe you're hearing that for the very first time. I suspect also there are some folks here today who, who do know, who understand the whole message of grace. But for whatever reason, insecurity, laziness, a desire to fit in, you just can't help but live by the rules. Yeah, 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 you know, the grace, grace part, that's good. But, you know, it's just a lot more easy and a lot more fun to be with people who are like me. And I don't have to deal with their junk and, and I don't have to talk about my junk. Let's just live by the rules. Smile a lot. And then I'm sure that there are many, many persons here who uh, not only understand it, but... You're living it. For the most part, you are experiencing grace and you are giving grace. But like me, you're recovering. And from time to time, you find yourself slipping back into old patterns and habits and just wishing that wasn't the case. Well, wherever you are on the spectrum, I have good news for you. And the good news is this. The transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ will meet you at your point of need. Do you hear what I'm saying? It will meet you at your point of need. If you're at a place where you just need to receive this for the first time, then Jesus is ready to give it to you. If you're at a place where you're awakening to the fact that you are a thoroughgoing legalist and you need to get over it, Jesus will help you do that. If you're a person who knows better but just struggles from time to time, Jesus is there for you too. And in a few minutes, I, I want to pray for us. I want us to just stop what we're doing. I'm not going to ask anybody to come down front. We're just going to bow right where we are. And, and I want to pray for you wherever you are in relationship to grace. If you're hearing it for the first time, I'm going to pray with you to receive it. And if you're hearing it for the 1,000th time, but you've just never chosen to live that way, not only am I going to pray for you, but I, I, I want to just give you a practical suggestion right here and now. If, if you know you're struggling with this, and it's hard for you to be gracious with other people, let me give you a first-hand invitation to come with me on a mission trip. 
say, well, what does that have to do with grace? I'll, everything. If you've never been to another culture, rub shoulders with other people who don't think or look or act or live like you do, that's a wonderful school for growing in grace. At 12.45 today, we're going to be up in the loft talking about all of the trips we have planned for this summer. I hope you'll come and learn about them. If you're a person who lives by grace but just needs to do a little repenting, we're going to do that too. But above all, I just want these closing minutes of our time together to be a time where we invite Jesus to come and do with us whatever it is he wants to do that allows us to become the men and the women, the boys and the girls that he created us to be, vessels of grace who are then empowered to give it to a world that desperately, desperately needs it. Will you pray with me? Father, I imagine we will spend all of eternity thanking you for loving us despite our unloveliness. Because with every single one of us here, if you just scratch the surface a little bit, there's going to be some ugliness there. There's going to be pain and sin and all kind of stuff. And yet you love us anyway. I want to pray, Father, for the people who are here today and they've heard this message of grace for the first time. And it almost seems too good to be true. Lord, show them that you mean it. That your son Jesus came not only to die for us, but to live with us and through us and empower us to be his people. I pray, Lord, for those who just can't find it within themselves to avoid the rules. It's been such a safety net for so long that giving it up is almost terrifying. Lord, show them how much better relationship is over rules. Give them grace to say I'm sorry and to turn around. For those, Lord, who do know better and who for the most part live better but still struggle, we say to you, we're sorry. We have no business judging anyone else. We're broken just like everyone else. We simply have been the recipients of amazing, amazing grace. And we want to be vessels of that grace to this broken world. Lord, won't you give us these things? We do need them, and we know you want to give them. So we ask in faith. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Dan, who just brought us part two of Jesus the Prequel. Today we talked about legalism mm -hmm. and how Jesus came to fulfill the law. Right. And so we have a couple questions. First, we're going to talk a little bit about law versus grace, yeah. and then we're going to talk about how we can practically apply some of the things that you talked about today. Okay. So for the first question, um, I think about, um, I grew up in the church, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people look at Christians and see that we have a lot of rules that we live by, sure. don't drink, don't smoke, whatever those rules are that you apply from the Bible. Right. Um, so then there's this idea of grace, mm -hmm. where you freely give grace. How, how did those balance? Is it just free to do whatever you want to do yeah. under grace, or can you speak to that? Sure. Um, uh, before I speak to it, I would uh, encourage our listeners to uh, go to the book of Romans where Paul probably gives the most articulate response to that question anyone has ever given. But uh, borrowing from Paul, the whole notion of grace is not to the absolute exclusion of the law. Uh, Jesus said that the law is still in force. It's the uh, means by which you choose to live out the law. If we live it according to our flesh, we are going to become judgmental and divisive 
and unloving, all of the sorts of things I talked about today. If, on the other hand, our lives are filled with grace, and it is the grace, the love of God, the relationship that we have with God through Jesus that empowers us then to live out the law, it's another matter entirely. It's not something that we are accomplishing. Uh, it's not something that we can be proud about or boast about. It's certainly not anything that would cause us to differentiate ourselves from, from someone else. Rather, it is a response to the love of God that's come into our lives. Is that Makes sense. Yeah. One of the things we talk about in Faith Bridge 101 is when you look at a disciple, we talk about a transformed heart mm -hmm. and how it's not from the outside in, but from the inside out That's right. that your life begins to change yeah. and you follow Jesus. That's it. Um, so I'm listening to this today and feeling convicted of areas where I believe that I've been guilty as well. And so how do I leave these walls and go out into the community and around my people um, and begin to live out a more graceful life. How do I do that? Well, I'll, I'll suggest two things. One, uh, I, I suggested in the message, I'll say it again, um, go on a mission trip. Uh, that's a very practical, easy sort of thing to do. Well, why do I suggest that? Primarily because it forces a person to deal with individuals who are different mm -hmm. than they are not just a different part of the world or a different skin color, but often different in terms of socioeconomic status, uh, religious beliefs, those sorts of things. It can be a wonderful classroom to begin to realize that uh, there's nothing special about me, mm. um, that God loves all of us uh, regardless of where we live or what we believe, uh, those sorts of things. But beyond a, a mission trip, in everyday life right here in Spring, Texas, I think there are uh, two key components, time mm -hmm. and communication. And the reason I lift those two up is because those are the two elements that are necessary for a healthy relationship. The only way to really know what someone else is like is to spend time with them and to talk with mm -hmm. them, to sort of scratch the surface of what we think they probably are. Mm -hmm. When you start spending time with people, as Jesus did, all sorts of different people, you not only begin to see that they have value in and of themselves, completely apart from their circumstances, but uh, I think even more importantly, it begins to work a change inside of you because uh, time and communication work against the reflexive action we have toward mm -hmm. judgment. It's a lot harder to judge somebody that you've talked to, really had a relationship with. Heard their story. Yeah, absolutely. From, what their life has been like. Yeah, yeah. You, you just never know the hurts, mm -hmm. the pain, the circumstance. I mean, behind every life, there, there's all sorts of stuff. And it's not until we're willing to get back and learn what some of those things are that I think we can begin to be set free from this sort of snap, oh, mm -hmm. okay, well, you do that, sorry. Um, so do like Jesus. Uh, get out with and begin to uh, form relationships with people who aren't like you mm -hmm. and discover the value that they have and the opportunity that you have to begin to extend grace to them as well. Great. Thank you, and thank you for your message today. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week as we continue part three of Jesus the Prequel. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.